today's topic, Charlie Eisman with Clear Sky Financial. It's so good to see you, Charlie. Um, and our topic today is subject to transactions um, and how to uh, basically how to how to, how everything uh, surrounding subject to transactions, uh, title, and um, the the mortgage part. So Charlie, uh, did you want to take it from here and we'll do questions and answers at the end of your presentation? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Yep. No thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to first uh, thank district title for uh, putting this together. Um, and I also, I also see some uh, familiar faces out there. So welcome. Welcome. Um, we had done this presentation. This is a, a small subset of a, of a bigger presentation on how and where to find the money during a market down cycle. And so what I did is I retailored the, the uh, uh, I retailored it to just focus on subject twos. And so that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do here. Um, uh, who I am, uh, this is basically my resume. Uh, I got an extensive real estate background, start out as a normal real estate agent, uh, 25, but I also have 25 years of uh, real estate investment. Uh, we have a bunch of companies out there that do various real estate things, and I'll go over that on the next slide. Um, I'm part of a couple of charities, president of Catholics for Housing, which is a charity that's solely responsible. Uh, we're a low income housing charity. Uh, I also have a charity called Clear Sky Sports Angels. Uh, we give uh, kids uh, who don't have the ability to pay to play travel sports. So we sort of support their activities kids that come from, uh, you know, distressed families that can't really afford it. So um, who we are, the Clear Sky Group, uh, we have a couple, we have a four-pronged business model. Uh, we have been fixing and flipping houses for 20 plus years. Uh, we do about two to three houses a month. We have a pretty good size rental portfolio. We own an industrial parking lot uh, for trucks. It's a three acre piece by Manassas Airport where we store semi-truck trailers. Um, we have a hard money company. Uh, the hard money company is Clear Sky Financial. Uh, that company's been around for uh, 10 plus years. We have about $35 million out there, uh, primarily in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, uh, even though we can lend in North Carolina and Florida. Uh, another company called Clear Sky Holdings. That company focuses on pretty much on what's called uh, tax lien certificates. So we do tax lien certificate investing as well. Um, and so we're, we're basically all across the board. Uh, we do have a, a lot of real estate investing knowledge. And so I'm going to share it to you guys subject twos today. Uh, so basically what I'm going to talk about is two-pronged approach to subject twos. I'm going to just approach it from the investment standpoint. Uh, it's also a good tool if you're an owner-occupant borrower. Um, so I'm, one of the assumptions that I'm making is that I am talking to both investors and I'm also talking to uh, real estate agents. If you're a real estate agent, you need to know about this because this is a good tool to put in your toolbox when either helping a buyer buy a house or even helping a seller sell a house. Because especially if they're they have a mortgage that has a really low interest rate, um, and you explain it correctly, uh, you could and the buyer has a pretty good size down payment. This is a way that you can help sell the house if it's a house that's in a tough sale environment. Um, Bob Hope once said, "Getting the money, a bank is a place that will lend you money." if you can prove that you don't need it. Uh, in this case, with subject twos, you're not really going through an application process. And so we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about is the current economic environment. Uh, like I said, this was a presentation that was how to find the money in a downward trending market. Um, and so one of the things that we have going on today in this current economic environment is, obviously we still have a high inf inflation um, we have rising interest rates. Uh, the Fed has increased the rates nine times since last, in about a year ago. We've had 4.75% increases. We've had two half point increases and 3.25% increases. I don't know if you guys realize that or not, but so the interest rates have increased almost 5% um, in the last year alone. 30 year mortgage was hovering around 7% in November, 2022. Today, they're about 6.25%. Um, and this is very critical to this presentation because this is why subject to financing is, is going to be a, a big deal in the next couple of years. Um, 
The housing market has slowed in some have slowed in some markets. It's a very subdivision specific market. There's other subdivisions where there's no inventory and they're getting multiple offers. So it all depends on where the house is located. And you really have got to understand this market down to the subdivision level. Uh, we just popped the mark, we just popped a house on the market uh, the other day. It was a fix and flip. It was in, in Woodbridge and about the 650 price range. And we thought it was going to take forever to sell. We got we got three offers before the weekend even happened, escalating up to seven hundred thousand dollars, and that wasn't even an entry level property. So I, we thought that was going to sit on the market for a while, but we ended up getting multiple offers on it. Um, the other thing that you guys got to pay attention to is the office space availability out there. I'm talking about the Class B, Class C space. Uh, we feel that there's going to be an in, impending market crash on those spaces, and a lot of these banks are going to probably be taken over. So stay tuned for that. I know it really doesn't have much relevance to this particular pre, uh, presentation, but one of the things that we always do in our presentations is we always got to go over the current economic environment so you guys kind of fully understand where we're at. The number of foreclosure filings are way up. Um, one of my uh, deal examples is actually a fix and flip on a pre-foreclosure, so stay tuned for that. And also, too, there is still low residential inventory out there. Um, and so that's the current market environment uh, as of today. All right, now, remember, uh, this was a presentation basically on how to find money sources in the downward trending market. And so these were other topics uh, that we have covered in the past. And so this one I'm just gonna cover today is subject to the existing mortgage. Um, and, and, and one of the uh, monikers that you'll hear is just subject to's. So people will say subject to's, I've seen it subject to TO, I've seen it subject number two, I've seen it described in many different ways. Um, the agenda today, what I wanna cover, I'm gonna cover um, a definition, I'm gonna cover a buy and hold deal example, I'll cover a fix and flip deal example, uh, we'll go over what a sample Maryland deed looks like, a sample Virginia deed, I didn't have anything really in DC, but um, it should be very close to the Maryland and Virginia sample deed. Uh, I'll cover the advantages and dis disadvantages of getting a subject to. Not really many disadvantage for the buyer, but there is a disadvantage for the seller. Um, and then we'll uh, go over a little topic on how to find them. Uh, and I know a lot of you guys that are on here, especially if you're investors, you know, you probably take a lot of courses. And one of the things that they fail to tell you is how to find these deals. So we'll, we'll go over some ideas on how to find these deals. Okay, so let's get into the meat of this. So a subject to financing, what is it? It's where a purchaser slash investor takes the right to the title for a property while the seller's existing mortgage stays in place, hence subject to. Um, I should have probably pluralized the word mortgage because you can do a subject to to more than one uh, mortgage. I've seen subject twos done on you know one or two mortgages. I, I've never really seen a subject two done on a third mortgage, but I have seen subject two done on a first trust and a second trust. You just have to understand the rest of the title and you have to understand obviously how much is owed on each instrument compared to the value of the property. But I have seen it done on more than one mortgage. Um, so basically what happens is, is the title slash D transfers to the new buyer. There's no formal bank approval process the purchaser slash investor simply takes over payments of the existing loan. Now, why is that important in today's market? Well, I just explained earlier how the Fed has already raised rates, you know, 5% over a year. You know, 30-year mortgage is hovering between 6.25 and 7%. So if you can get a, uh, an existing mortgage, nine times out of 10, it's probably gonna have a much lower interest rate than what it is today. So that's why it's very critical that um, we talk about that in today's market because this is a really good vehicle on how to get a good property at a pretty low interest rate, take advantage of it. Um, most, I shouldn't say most mortgages, but yeah, I guess most mortgages have a due on sale clause. Um, what does that mean? That means if the existing loan, if the mortgagor finds out that the title has transferred to another party, they have the right within their deed of trust to call the loan. OK, so if they find out that the, the, the house is transferred to somebody else and they find out they can they can say uh, they can call the loan and have you pay it in full. Now, how many times have I ever seen that happen? Uh, the total is zero. But there's a caveat to that. Provided you as the buyer continues and pays 
the underlying instruments slash instruments current. Keep your insurance current. Keep all the things current that you're supposed to do. Um, it's very, very unlikely that they're going that the bank is going to call the loan. Um, but you do have some responsibilities that you do have to do to make sure that that due on sale clause isn't called. Um, but, but this is a disadvantage to the seller. The purchaser, from a liability standpoint, they really don't have to pay the loan. They don't have to make any payments. Um, and so that's sort of a disadvantage to the seller. But remember, the purchaser has a lot of motivation. Uh, a lot of times the investor slash purchaser is probably purchasing into a decent equity position, right? If they're buying it as an owner occupied loan, they are actually paying at a lower interest rate, uh, usually a 30 year AMP schedule, which is very favorable. But more importantly, they are further into the amortization schedule when they purchase it. So the purchaser has a lot of incentive to keep these things going, which is why I, I don't, I've, I've never really heard of a, a bank calling the mortgage. Okay, that's the definition. Um, the next thing I wanna cover is uh, two deal examples on deals that we've done with subject twos. Um, so the first one will we'll, we'll cover a buy and hold deal where the, the investor purchased the property um, and they kept it as a rental and it's still in their portfolio to this day. Uh, the second deal that I'll cover um, is, a, is, is a fix and flip. And this particular fix and flip, they did a subject two on the purchase but us as the hard money lender, we lent them the money as a second trust and we lent the money towards their down payment and towards their renovation costs. So we've done deals where, um, where, we, where we purchased it and deals where we've actually funded it on, as a second trust. Okay, so this particular deal, um, I really can't tell you guys the total address, but I gave you a lot of it. Um, seven, whatever, Ripplebrook Drive and Culpepper was a subject property. It was a, it was a pre foreclosure. Um, that's how the property was found. Uh, and the way they found it was that they just are canvass canvassing the uh, trustee sale ads in the newspaper or online. And they found a deal that was a pre-foreclosure that had an auction date set on it. Um, they did a search on the tax record. The owner, the property was vacant and the owner was an out-of-town owner. Uh, the owner happened to be living in the Philadelphia area uh, of New Jersey. Um, that's where they lived. The original loan was $218,000 um, and it was a VHDA loan. And so for you guys that aren't familiar with VHDA loan, it's, it's what's called a Virginia first time home buyer loan. It's very similar to an FHA loan, but it's on the Virginia side. So each different jurisdiction, all depending upon where you guys are, will have different kinds of loans like this. So in this case, it's a VHDA loan, which is very similar to an FHA loan in Virginia. The loan origination date was December 30, 2015. It was a 3.75% 30-year AM, which is a very good late rate loan, but the loan was in arrearages for $44,002. So in other words, there was a foreclosure date sold. You had to bring the loan current and you had to pay $44,002 to bring a current. And I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, the current loan amount as of the time of the purchase was $192,500. So once the $44,002 was paid, then the uh, principal amount left on the loan at that time was $192,500. And that's very important for you to understand that because the next slide that I'm gonna talk about is gonna be the, uh, the actual art of the deal. Um, so what we did is we gave the owner uh, $10,000 uh, for him to sign off on the deed. Us as a uh, clearest guy financial put a second trust on the property for $44,002 to the investor because uh, we didn't buy this clear sky properties, another investor bought it. So the purchase price was basically the 192.5 that was left on the first trust when they bought it, the $10,000 that went to the seller to give the seller incentive to actually sign off on the deed, and then 44,002 to bring the loan current. Now the 44,002 actually went to the law firm who was considered the substitute trustee who was foreclosing on the house. So the total, the total purchase price was 245502. Okay. Now the after repair value at the time was 375. So they bought into about $130,000 equity position. The PITI of the subject to uh, payment was 1365. Because remember, this was a loan being ser serviced by VHDA and it included taxes and insurance portion of the payment. So the payment was 1365. 
they cash loaded at 1950 a month, the total rent payment, and there was a positive cash flow of 585. So they bought into an equity position of about 130, and I need to caveat that, and I will in a second. So they bought into an, an equity position of 130, and because of the lower interest rate they took advantage of, they were able to do a positive cash flow of 585. Now, they weren't technically into an equity position of 130 because um, they did have to put some renovation costs into the property. Um, the property was vacant, uh, but it was a one level, uh, let me go back for the, it was a one level, three bedroom, two bath house built in 1998. So it did need some renovation costs to make it rent ready. So the renovation cost was probably about 20 grand. Um, so once the 20 grand was put in for the renovation, uh, they had an equity position of about 110, and but they had a free floating cash flow vehicle of 585 a month. Oh, by the way, while paying down the subject to mortgage, which was a little bit further down into the AM schedule. Remember, it was a 30 year AM schedule originated in 2005. So when they bought it, they were they were already six years into the AM schedule. So they had 24 more years left on that loan. Okay, guys, get it? All right. Deal example uh, number two. Um, let me check time real quick. All right, I'm not doing too bad. Um, deal example number two was a fix and flip. Um, I put I actually put the full address just so you guys can kind of look at it uh, from the time that they put on the MLS, so you can kind of see the renovation and how quickly quickly it took them to sell. And we were actually a second trust on this on this property as well. Um, so the background on this deal was um, two level townhouse. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dale City. It's in Dale City, which is a, a development in Northern Virginia. Um, it's in Woodbridge, 22193. Um, it's a, it was an end unit, two level townhouse, uh, four bedrooms, two full baths and two half baths, built in 1968. Now, this house was a rental for 20 plus years and was owned by an out of town owner. So this deal was brought to our attention, whereas the first buy and hold deal, we, we pretty much found that one. Uh, this deal was brought to our, our attention by an investor that had used this many times on the hard money side. The renovation budget was $50,000 um, because it was a two level townhouse. I think the square footage was about 1,280 square feet, something like that. Um, but you know, not having that third level made the renovation budget a little cheaper. And oh, by the way, uh, this renovation was done back in uh, 2013 where, uh, the, uh, where the renovations were a little bit cheaper. Uh, everything was cheaper, labor was cheaper, materials were cheaper, so that 50,000 was the budget. Um, I'm sorry, not 2013, it was actually 2020 when we did this deal, but even back then the renovations were cheaper. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the subject to interest rate, uh, just because we did this deal like three or four years ago and you know, even if I did a deed of trust search uh, in Prince William County, I, I probably wouldn't have found the interest rate. So I'm not exactly sure what the interest rate is, but because um, it was a, it was a uh, fix and flip, I, we're not really, we don't really care about the interest rate because they're only paying on it for three or four months. And I can tell you one thing right now, us being the second trust on this property from a hard money standpoint, the interest rate was probably a little bit cheaper than we charged them. Okay. Um, purchase price was 168.336. The subject to loan balance was 120.37. Remember, it originated for 133.900. And about seven years later, it did get paid down to 12037. Uh, the cash to the seller was 4829, but it's actually 4829 minus uh minus uh, uh some closing fees. So I think the seller netted out about I don't know 42000 dollars or something like that. I don't I don't know exactly, but there was some seller netted out closing fees. Um, the after repair value at the time of the purchase was around 295. That was my number was about 295. So what we did is we came behind the um, first trust and we just popped a, a $75,000 second trust on top of it. Now, one of the things you guys that one of the things that you guys have to understand is that the owner has now taken ownership of the property, right? So it, it's in, uh, you know, uh, third, let's say it's 3218 Birchdale Square LLC is the owner. The first trust is is still in the name of the previous owner. But our second trust through Clear Sky Financial was made out to the current owner. 
So you've got two liens and you had two liens in this case. The first lien was to the original owner and the second lien that was owed to us was through the current purchaser that bought it. Um, so you have, to, you have to understand that, not a big deal. So then what these guys did, um, and I think it was a, let me go back to the previous slide. I think it was a three or four month flip. Yeah, he bought it in April 30th, 2020, and he round tripped it in uh, uh, July 18th, 2020. So it's that May, June. So like a two and a half, two and a half month uh, flip. And so the challenging part to the title company was that when they went to close the property on the out sale, they just had to go and get a payoff of a, of a, the, you know, of a lien that was in somebody else's name. So, you know, you, they have their ways to, to get those payoffs. And so one of the things that you guys want to do when you're dealing with subject to transactions is that, and I want to, again, I want to thank district title for having me on, is that you want to use a title company similar to district title slash MBH um, that knows how to do these deals, right? They're very familiar with these deals. Um, and so that's why it's very, very important to you as the end user to use the title company that's very familiar with these deals because this isn't your this isn't your normal run of the mill cookie cutter real estate transaction. There's there's a little bit of thing there's some things that need to be done uh, in dealing with this, and that's what I'll get into into the next thing. So the next two slides are examples of deeds that the first one's one that was example recorded in Maryland, and and one of the things that you have to understand is that. When you normally have a deed and it conveys to the purchaser, uh, you'll see a deed and the deed is only signed by the seller, right? Conveying it to the purchaser, that's the only signature on here. A lot of times on these deeds, when you're involved in the subject too, you'll see the deed is signed by both the seller and both the purchaser. And, and the main reason behind that is because the purchaser has to understand the subject to of the purchase, right? Just in case these things get, get called out. And so in this particular deal, the one in Maryland, this was actually, uh, like I said earlier, this was actually a two trust or a two mortgage uh, a deal. And so there were two subject to instruments on this particular deal. Um, and the next deed that I wanna show is just an example of a deed in Virginia. Um, very, similar, very similar to Maryland. Um, and again, uh, it, it does have the subject to stuff on there, um, just so that it's fully understood because uh, the, in the legal world, it's very important that, especially from a title company standpoint, and, and even you as purchasers and sellers, it's all about disclosure. You've got to disclose. So you've got to disclose everything relevant about this transaction. And so what this deed does is it disclosed that, yeah, there was an ownership transfer, but more importantly though, it has been disclosed that there is an ownership transfer with the caveat that there is a subject to transfer. So it's very, very important that, that it, is, it is disclosed. Um, okay, so what are some advantages of subject to, to deals? I mean, as you guys obviously know, that's why you're on this call more likely is that the number one thing is interest rates, right? You're getting the instrument at a lower interest rate. Um, the next thing is uh, the terms of the existing note. Right, it could be a 15-year AM schedule, it could be a 30-year AM schedule. It's just that you're buying this thing and you're further down the AM schedule paydown, which is very favorable. Um, there's no application documentation. There's no credit check. Um, so if you've got banged up credit, you know you file bankruptcy, you've had foreclosures on your record, you know just you can still buy it, no problem. Uh, minimal minimal down payment, if any. Um, uh, the other deals that I talked about. Um, they had to come up with $54,000. Really, they only came up with $10,000 because we put a $44,000 second on it. This deal, um, they, uh, they, they didn't come up with much. We, we provided the $50,000 renovation and we provided $25,000 towards their down payment. So all in actuality, they only came up with like $25 additional thousand dollars. So, that, so that's, an, that's an advantage you, is you can structure the down payment any way you want, but that's into the purchase price. Um, and like I said before, it's further into the AM schedule. And so that, that, that's a positive uh, standpoint. Um, disadvantage, uh, there's really only two that I know of. There might be more, but the bank can recall the loan at any time on ownership change. But remember earlier, I talked about how many times I've actually seen that happen. And the answer is zero. But remember though, as a purchaser slash investor, you wanna make sure that you make those payments on a timely basis 
uh, keep keep your insurance up to date, right? You don't want the old one to fall through. A lot of times in the other deal, the buy and hold deal, the old insurance was in place because it was a, it was a PITI situation and the servicer being VHDA, they paid the annual mortgage insurance, but we advised the buyer um, to go ahead and get their own insurance policy and naming them as the uh, beneficiary as well as the bank. So that in case something happens, you are cited on the insurance um, and you don't have to go back to the old insurance. You, you probably need to cancel that because if something happens to the property um, then and you don't have your own insurance policy on there and the other one isn't canceled, then there's going to be a check written out to the servicer and to the former owner. So you need to you need to avoid that situation. So once you buy this house, you need to get a, a hazard insurance policy in place in your name. The other disadvantages, um, the former owner is still on hook for the obligation. Now, obviously you as the purchaser, you don't really care, you do care. Um, so that let's say the market drops, you know, 20, 30% and you're upside down on a subject to deal. I mean, you can as the buyer walk away, um, but then that lien will, the, the former owner is still on the hook for that obligation, disadvantage to the owner. Um, la I think this is the last topic. Yep, last topic before we open it up to questions. Um, how to find subject to deals. Uh, not too bad, 30 minutes in. Uh, how to find subject to deals. Um, remember, on my buy and hold example, uh, you know, you can look up the pre-foreclosure ads in the newspaper, uh, Maryland, D.C., Virginia. Now, the problem is, is sometimes, most of, actually most of the times, these ads will just give you the foreclosing instrument number. So you'll have to look back in the land records for that interest number, interest number, instrument number. But sometimes you're just going to look at a deed of trust. So even back in the land records, the deed of trust might not have the interest rate. But the way to figure out maybe what the interest rate, if it's favorable to you, could be because if it, if it was originated on a certain date, right? So that could help you out with that if, if the interest rate isn't published in the deed of trust. Sometimes it is. Okay. So one of the good ways of doing it is just canvas the pre-foreclosure ads before they go to the courthouse steps. Um, in DC and Maryland, it's actually the auction. It's still the courthouse steps, but the auction house does the auctions. Um, you can uh, find out-of-town owners. Probably the best way to do that is probably to uh, maybe buy, create your own list um, off the tax records yourself or buy some lists of out-of-town owners. But the key is you want to find out-of-town owners that have purchased properties in a certain date frame to where you know the odds are that the interest rate is probably pretty much favorable to your advantage. Um, realtor referrals is a good source. Um, you can focus on the subject to, uh, I, I create another category called subject to mailers. Uh, focus on lists where mortgage originations were between March, 2019 and March, 2022, before the rates started climbing. Um, you can go do driving for dollars, uh, find vacants and blighted. But then once you find the vacant blighted houses and you put it on your hidden market list, you're still gonna have to figure out, do a little title search and find out the origination date of these loans. Um, but those are some uh, pretty good ways of, you know, ideas of, of how you can, can find these deals. Um, they're out there. Uh, you just gotta, you know, dig, dig for them and, and you gotta find them and, 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 you know, they're not simple to find, but that's where you're gonna spend most of your time and energy is, is finding, uh, finding these deals. That's it. That's all I got. You guys have any questions? We can do the questions in the chat box, um, or you can come off mute and ask the question directly if you'd like. I had a quick question for you. In the uh, in the, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. In the buy and hold example that you gave, you had the uh, the cash flow that you uh, calculated the five eighty five. That was based on the original financing. Um, with the hard money loan of the forty four k, did they cash out of that hard money loan, or how how did that work? Oh, uh, that got that got paid back. Okay, okay. straight just a straight payback. So that's a good question. So yeah, I, I didn't I didn't include that piece on there in there. Um, just because that 44.2 is it was sort of a private hard money slash private and there was really no payment associated with it. It was just a straight, you know, once you fix and flipped a couple more houses, this particular investor had fixed and flipped a lot of houses. So okay. they used the profit from the one deal to pay off the 44.2. Got and it. So 
at the bottom uh, was the cash flow after that money was paid off. Okay, and that was and then they off. renovated and then they renovated the, the the house out of their own pocket. So technically, they had about sixty five thousand out of their own money. Well, twenty five that twenty thousand out of their pocket of renovation, and then eventually that forty four thousand came back. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So then after the asset was stabilized. The loan payment is still to this day, thirteen sixty-five. The rent payment was nineteen fifty. It it it, it, it might have gone it, it might have gone up because this deal was done and this deal was done um, two three years ago. So the rent might be higher than nineteen fifty. I, I just didn't go back and look at that, but the the free flowing cash flow is five is five eighty five. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, yeah, yeah. so we have a chat question. So Lisa uh, has asked, other than avoiding a foreclosure, why would a homeowner do this if they're still on the hook for the loan? Uh, beca because they're able to sell their house for a much higher price, number one, provided that they want to make the seller put a huge down payment down. Right. So there's two ways. The first way is they'll they could get a higher price for their house um, because these guys will be buying into a lower interest rate environment. But the seller has got to be careful that they better at that point in time, if it's a purchaser that's an owner OC, then they better make them put down a huge down payment so that they'll have no incentive to let it go to foreclosure. The second reason and the more important reason is that, remember, I did this presentation into a downward trending market. The shock city that we're going through right now is the fact that this market is still appreciating in certain areas. But once the market cools down and your house becomes harder and harder to sell, you might want to use this as an instrument to sell your house into a harder to sell environment, but still have the purchaser buy, you know, put down a larger down payment so they have the incentive to pay it off. And, that, and that's the reason why. Okay, a couple more questions from Stephen. What, if anything, would need to be done in if years in the future you wanted to refinance a sub two loan to pull some equity out? Um, I, I pro. It depends, right? I, I think. Let's say we're we're looking into the future, right? Obviously, the interest rate environment of the future is very very important uh, because. Uh, you know, we're talking about historically low interest rates. So I don't know that I would ever refinance that sub two mortgage. What I would do though, all depend upon if it's an owner occupied house or a rental, it depends on what you got. Uh, I would I would just simply get a home equity line of credit on it. So if if I'm a if I'm a if I'm an owner OC and I have this and the house goes up in value and I'm in a good equity position. I would get a uh, uh, simply a homeowner home 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 uh, equity line of credit. Now, as an owner occupant, you know some banks will lend up to ninety five percent. I'm sorry, eighty five to ninety percent of the appraised value minus the balance of the first trust, and they'll lend it. You know, they'll lend that. So that what they do is they'll say, okay, the value of the house is let's say five hundred grand. Me as the bank, I'll lend eighty percent of that five hundred grand. So I'll lend 400,000 minus the balance of that first trust, and you can get a home equity line of credit. I would probably do that. Whereas if it's an investor property, it all depends. Some banks don't have that uh, HELOC product on investor properties. So, so it just all depends. And if they do have the home equity line of credit product, which you should probably go to a community bank for that, then they'll only lend at maybe 70% of the after repair value minus the, the amount left on the first trust. So I would probably not refinance it unless of course it's a better interest rate environment. I would just simply get a home equity line of credit if that makes sense. But if it is, but if it is a rental property, then if a normal bank won't do it, then I would go to a community bank and, and, and establish a relationship with a community bank. Okay, this is a question probably for the attorneys, um, okay. Jack and David. Uh, are there any additional steps to lessen the likelihood of bank accelerating the loan, such as a transfer into a trust, leave initial owner on record as minority shareholder, et cetera? I wouldn't recommend that. Um, it, it's going to look 
a lot like Thrawn if you're sort of going out of your way to pretend like it hasn't been sold. So I, I certainly would recommend a course of action like that. And David, is there any other documents such as uh, power of attorney that may be helpful? Yeah. We do not uh, take care of uh, power of attorney from your seller to the end buyer, but you're going to want to reach out to the, the lender with your seller and see if they use a specific power of attorney. And um, if not, have a power of attorney drafted from your seller to your buyer. Um, specific purpose of getting a payoff or talking to the lender. Okay, perfect. Um, and then uh, we do have a question, Charlie, can we contact you directly to help analyze potential deals? Yeah, you got, you got, yeah, you guys can contact me anytime. Um, we, uh, that, that's pretty much all I do all days, uh, analyze deals. That's all I do, whether it's from us lending on the hard money side or us buying on the fix and flip side or us buying is, you know, putting rentals in our portfolio, which we haven't done much of that lately. Um, and so, yeah, you guys can reach out to me with anything. It's that's all I do anyway, is sit here and, you know, evaluate deals. You know, that's, right, that's great. much what we do. All right. Marvin has asked, what does the, the dialogue with the seller look like on this? I've pitched it several times and each time the seller said they don't want to be a, a bank. I guess it comes down to motivation, but I've not yeah. walked up yet. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it comes down to is it comes down to number one, obviously motivation. And I know Marvin, how are you doing, Marvin? Um, Marvin, Marvin's a realtor. And so uh, he's an investor as well. Uh, so so I'll, I'll caveat it from both sides of the fence, right? Number one, obviously, is motivation. And so, but I'm assuming, though, that if it's a normal retail seller, right, the best, the only and best way it will probably work is if you're in a subdivision division that's a hard to move subdivision and so you want to be the best of the bunch right and so this will work but if there isn't much motivation on the seller's behalf they're always going to say no but if you can bring in a buyer that does have a large down payment then it would incentivize the seller to do it provided they it'll do two things it'll help the seller get a max price right? And it will help move a property in a downward trending market. Remember though, uh, we're at, a, I don't care where you are in this country, we are at a subdivision market. So I've seen three different types of subdivisions. I've seen the one subdivision, that's what we call a bull subdivision, where you have, let's say you have 20 houses on the market, you might have one active, six contracts, and 13 solds within a 120 day period. I've seen other subdivisions where you have the equal number of actives and contracts, which is more of a neutral subdivision. And I've also seen subdivisions where I've seen seven or eight actives, maybe one under contract and maybe three closed, which is a subdivision that's a downward trending subdivision. So it just all depends on that subdivision itself where the house sits. Obviously in a downward trending subdivision, pitching to your seller to sell on a subject two might work because that's gonna get them the highest price against all those actives, right? And it will, and it, it could get them maybe a little bit higher price than the market because remember, there's no appraiser involved provided they put down a higher down payment. That's the way you sell it to the seller, but it will work in a normal retail market provided you're in a downward trending subdivision which, like I said, in this area, it's it's kind of a hit or miss. Marvin, I hope I answered it. Yeah, he just said, I he also added that he targeted all off market. Okay, so in that case, Marvin, it's all it's all about the motivation. It's all about the motivation. Yeah, I mean, if it's a if it's an owner, let's say if it's an owner occupied house, and it's off market owner occupied house, and let's say the house is in beautiful condition, um, then obviously they're not going to have much motivation right, off market and it's vacant or off market is blighted, they'll probably have a lot more motivation. But then again, you as the realtor or you as the investor, one of the things that you need to tell them is you need to tell them what your end game is. If you go in there and say, my end game is fix and flip, then they're probably more likely to do it. If you're going to go in there and say, my end game is a buy and hold, 
and that instrument might be out there for another five, 10, 15 years, that might change their motivation as well. Um, okay, so Raz has uh, asked a follow-up question to you, David. Is it a good idea to purchase on the name or a trust or LLC under any circumstances? I mean, I don't see it being a bad idea to buy an LLC because it gives you limited liability. Um, you know, uh, a, a lot of people do. They create like, you know, specific purpose entities just for that single property. Um, and then, you know, for whatever reason, you have an issue down the road, um, you know, the extent of your liability is basically the asset, the property itself. Um, I'm not really sure there's a whole lot of benefit to buying in a trust and maybe some estate planning benefits that, you know, you can, you can always have cert certain tax benefits, but, you know, I don't think there's any special benefit for buying in a trust for, for a subject to transaction that I can think of. Okay, um, and then Nick has asked, does this complicate the seller's ability to get a mortgage on their next home since they still have the loan in their name? It, I mean, it it will it will show up on their credit, and it will show up as a full debt because uh, they don't have any rental income to offset it. That's why it's really really important as a seller that you understand the buyer's intent, right? Again, fix and flip, move into it, buy and hold, right? So it's very important that you understand the intent. But that 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 mortgage stays out on your credit report. It still shows up. You gotta if you're filing out another mortgage application, you, you know you you need to disclose it. I mean, you can try to not disclose it, but they're gonna find it, I, and I wouldn't recommend that anyway. Just to piggyback off of you, Charlie, um, I would also say that it could help the credit because if they're behind yeah. and you're bringing yeah. it forward. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so if they are sure. in foreclosure or pre-foreclosure, it could help. Um, they may not be able to buy a house anyway if they're in. Yeah, home. yeah, that's a that's a great point. It's definitely going to help build back their credit in a in a right. distress situation for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh. Rebecca uh, has asked. I have heard that as an investor, you can use a servicing company to make the payments if that is used. Uh they can help show proof or rental income? Yep. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Reliving, yes. Yep. It's a good, and, good so comment. is there any other questions? Carlin, did we, maybe a distant uh, here, did we go over the question um, on uh, availability of due on sale insurance? No, I don't see that. Can you ask okay. that? Okay, uh, that, that's a that's a that, you know that's a great question, um, and and I really and and that's one of the things uh, I thoroughly research researched that um, in the last twenty four hours just because I was going to actually put it as part of the presentation, but there's not any I and I thought there was a company out there that provided due on sale clause insurance, but it's not insurance that they provide. It's There's a company out there that does assurance, A-S-S-U-R-A-N-C-E. It's assurance, not insurance, because uh, this subject to world isn't re regulated enough from an insurance standpoint. So as far as I know, there is not any insurance companies out there. Now, there is an assurance company out there, A-S-S-U-R-A-N-C-E, assurance that um, but I don't really trust the fact that they're going to do what they say, because one of the things that they were talking about is that they'll assure, in other words, they'll charge you a fee and that they'll assure the fact that the due on sale clause will be taken care of. But the way they supposedly want to take care of it, but you have some caveats that you got to do. You got to have it current. You've got to have the insurance up to date. And if it's a non-escrow account, you got to have the property taxes current. And then what they think they're going to do is go out in that secondary market, approach the bank or the servicer that has that loan and try and buy it, try to buy the loan from them. But it sounds a little dicey, um, but there is a company out there that does assurance, A-S-S-U-R-A-N-C-E, no companies that do insurance. 
And is somebody that, can uh, chime in and correct insurance? me if I'm wrong, but I'm not so sure. Was that equity assurance by chance? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I did a little uh, dive too. I couldn't find anyone that offered insurance. Right, right. In and, and the reason and the reason is, is because it's not, it's not regulated. Um, I just saw assurance, but I mean, like I said, uh, yeah. All yeah. right. Any other questions, title questions, mortgage questions? Well, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Wow. Yeah, I wanted to actually thank you, Charlie, and thank, uh, thank everyone that joined us today. And I, I wanted to share um, our next virtual session is going to be on the 14th of June. Um, we're going to dive, uh, dig deep into wholesaler contracts and agreements. Just so if anyone wants to register, that should be up about late next month. Right. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, guys. Right. We'll see you later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.